Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Cosmos. I'm the Division Director for the Division of State and Local Readiness here at CDC and a frequent um, lead, co-lead on our uh, STLT task force. Um, welcome back to the Community of Practice. I know many of you have joined the Community of Practice in the past when we were meeting weekly or every other week around supporting state and locals around uh, COVID-19 response, we have switched topics. And this week, we're going to be talking about um, innovative and creative strategies for improving outreach and for improving vaccination levels in um, populations that are uh, requesting mon monkeypox vaccinations. Uh, we have a really good lineup for you today. I think you'll find some really creative and innovative strategies that our jurisdictions have used to increase the vaccination rates in the targeted communities. Um, just a reminder, like I always say, this is not a call for the media. So if you're a member of the media, we ask you to disconnect at this time. Let me go over our agenda for you today. First up, we're going to have Greg Batista, who is the coordinator of CDC's Monkeypox Vaccine Equity Pilot Program. And Greg is going to talk about some of CDC's monkeypox emergency response efforts, focusing on assuring that vaccine gets to those that need it most. Greg is a member of our Community Engagement Task Force, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the CDC strategies for reducing disparities. Then we're going to turn it over to our colleagues from Michigan, Keith, Hugh Keith Hughes and Mark Hammert. And they're going to talk about um, innovative approaches that Mi Michigan has used to develop and better support access to monkeypox vaccination through some direct outreach efforts. Then we'll turn it over to our colleagues from Washington, D.C., Christine Willett, or Christina Willett, sorry, who is the Division of Epidemiology Outbreak Investigations Lead at D.C. Health. And Christina is going to talk about closing the inequity gap in monkeypox vaccination rates by working to eliminate barriers. Then we're going to turn to our, um, our, our neighbors in DeKalb County, Georgia, Linda O'Sullivan and Minzi Zing, who uh, are going to talk about vaccine equity strategies for monkeypox in DeKalb County, Georgia, and talk about some of the challenges that they had for monkeypox uh, vaccine equity and some of the strategies that they also use. And then our friends from Oregon, Hector uh, Zarangaza, is going to talk about um, OHA's creative solutions on closing vaccine equity gaps. And he's going to highlight some of the work that's been done at the local level. Um, and then we will open it up for Q&A. So that is a super packed agenda for all of you today. And just so you know, we have to leave a few minutes early, so we're not going to go exactly to the end of the hour. So I'm going to get it started and turn it over to Greg. Thank you, Chris. So a brief overview. Recently, the White House announced a pilot program to reach populations who are at elevated risk of contracting monkeypox virus, but may face barriers in accessing the vaccine, such as lack of access to online appointment scheduling, for example, or stigma and language barriers and other barriers. As part of the vaccine equity pilot program, the administration set aside vials of Geneos vaccine that health departments can request for use as part of innovative and effective vaccine equity interventions. And I'll paste the link about the program in the chat box now. CDC's Monkeypox Vaccine Equity Pilot Program was developed to demonstrate effective ways to address vaccination disparities. Now, what exactly are we talking about when we say monkeypox vaccination disparities? Well, just to put it plainly, we're talking about situations where a population is overrepresented among monkeypox cases and also less likely to be vaccinated. So I'll share a quick example to answer the question, what are some populations that are experiencing monkeypox vaccination disparities? And I'll use national data, but you can also answer the same question for your local jurisdiction using monkeypox case data and vaccine administration data at the local level. 
I'll paste right now the link to a link to uh, CDC's data on monkeypox cases by race ethnicity. The figure shows that persons who are Black, African American, represented 44% of all monkeypox cases in the United States that were newly reported in the most recent week of data, which is October 16th. Now, when we compare this 44% against the proportion of Black, African American persons in the US population, we can see that monkeypox really is disproportionately affecting our Black African American community. And the last link I'll share, this is data from CDC's website about vaccine administration by race ethnicity. And although Black African American persons represent 44% of all newly reported monkeypox cases, this population represents really a far smaller percentage of the total number of monkeypox vaccine administrations. So at the national level, we can see that Black African-American persons are, like I said earlier, overrepresented among monkeypox cases and less likely to be vaccinated. So this is just one example of a population facing monkeypox vaccination disparities. And in today's webinar, as Chris mentioned, you'll hear from colleagues in health departments throughout the United States that are uh, working to bring monkeypox vaccination specifically to populations that are experiencing vaccination disparities, like Black, African American, gay, and bisexual men. You'll also hear about the importance of collaborating with community-based organizations. And I understand that on today's webinar, we also have colleagues, not just from health departments, but also many invited from community-based organizations that provide services to our LGBTQ community. People, for example, who work in health centers or organizations that provide HIV testing services, volunteer groups, and more. If your organization provides services for members of our LGBTQ community, please know that you can play a critical role in reducing monkeypox vaccination disparities because of your expertise, your rapport with our community, and your firsthand knowledge of how best to mitigate the types of barriers we face. And that's why I want to encourage you as community partners to contact the health department in your jurisdiction to share your creative ideas for getting more people vaccinated from monkeypox with the focus on people who are experiencing vaccination disparities. The health department in your jurisdiction is authorized to request vaccine from this program and to collaborate with you on strategies for getting vaccine into arms. And if you'd like to offer vaccine to anyone in your network, including clients, patients, community members, please put your ideas together. We are welcoming and encouraging all proposals. So feel free to discuss your ideas with your health department and they can work with you to develop a proposal and submit it to CDC. If you'd like help connecting with your health department, you can use the contact us form at the bottom of the program page and we'll connect you. And of course, colleagues who work in health departments, state, local, territorial, or tribal health departments, we also welcome your input, your questions, using the contact us form at the bottom of the page. And if your health department would like to submit a proposal but don't have the application form, you can use the contact us form as well to receive the link to the application form. Thank you. And now, without further ado, I'll turn it back to Chris Cosmos. Thank you. Thanks so much, Greg, for that great overview. Now we're going to turn it over to our colleagues from Michigan, Keith Hughes and Mark Hemmert. Keith and Mark. Hey, afternoon, everybody. Um, and thanks again for inviting us to speak. Uh, my name is Mark Hemmert. Uh, I work with MDHHS. Uh, and if we could go to next slide. Um, so we kind of wanted to focus on how we've had a pretty non-traditional or non-standard approach for some of our vaccine outreach. Um, if we could check out the next slide. Um, kind of to Greg's point, um, speaking about overrepresented populations, uh, I don't want to go through all the data here, but if you're interested in Michigan specific data, you can check out that link, michigan.gov mpv. 
Um, a couple uh, things that I did want to highlight uh, on that demographic breakdown, um, specifically that in Michigan, 60% of our cases have been among African Americans, um, despite African Americans making up about 14% of Michigan's population and 54% uh, of cases among people with living with HIV. Um, I know a recent stat from CDC showed, like as of today, just 7% of MPV vaccine has been given so far to people who are black. In Michigan, 17% um, of our vaccine recipients have been among people who are black, which is uh, nicely above the national average, but I think everyone on this call would agree that there's a lot more that, that can and should be done. Um, go to the next slide. Um, so direct community level outreach, like I mentioned, um, particularly during like, non-traditional or non-standard hours has been a really big focus for us. Um, in Detroit and Southeast Michigan particularly, we've had a really strong collaborative group of providers, health departments, CBOs, um, folks that have really stepped up to work together and show up uh, you know, for the LGBTQ plus community. So meeting folks where they're at, where they feel comfortable, um, and it's been really well received both by the community, by venue organizer or event organizers, venue owners, um, just being present uh, has been great, I think in rebuilding trust in public health, um, particularly among a community of folks that uh, I think often feels excluded. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so just some photos of examples of us out at some of the events. Um, some of these clinics that have been uh, put on are hosted on location at some of our LGBTQ plus affirming provider clinics. Others like our pull-up project events at places like Palmer Park, which in Detroit is a popular spot um, for cruising, as well as among Detroit's unhoused population. And then obviously a big focus for us has been bars, venues, and events that primarily serve the LGBTQ population um, in an area that is primarily black. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so like the outreach push really started in a pretty grassroots way. Um, both myself and Keith uh, from Detroit Health Department uh, were both proud members of the LGBTQ plus community and have been able to use some of our personal connections to help establish or reestablish and strengthen partnerships um, between public health and those folks. So working with bar owners, drag queens, event promoters, DJs, folks in the leather community um, have all led to these, what have mostly been late night pop-up clinics that we've been holding. Um, we've given over 300 MPV vaccines, um, like I said, with a focus on venues and events in a city like Detroit, whose population is almost 80% black. Um, and there's a couple upcoming opportunities we're really excited about. Um, we're starting to focus on opportunities beyond just the late night kind of bar type events. One being a partnership with Gospel Against AIDS, uh, working with their population and communities of faith that their program reaches, um, as well as a large ball event that's happening um, in conjunction with a prep rally event next month, uh, which I'll pass over to Keith to talk more about. Yes, thank you so much, Mark. Um, again, I'm Keith Hughes, I'm the CM Public public health educator for the city of Detroit Health Department. Uh, one of the things that, like Mark said, do we've been using our personal uh, personal connections and relations with community stakeholders. Um, one in particular, um, which is the prep rally ball that is coming up next month, uh, November the 19th. Uh, what we did was we actually worked with not only the city of Detroit Health Department's immunization team, but also uh, Dr. Shira Heisler at the Detroit, was it the Detroit, public health STI clinic. Um, they have been working diligently with uh, partnering with not only with stakeholders, which is uh, promoters within the community just to uh, respond and have availability for uh, the monkeypox vaccination. And one of the things that they were talking about doing was actually putting together um, a two-part series uh, where individuals will be able to receive uh, re re receive the vaccine. So the date of the event, they'll be at full, uh, full efficacy of um, having to actually um, vaccine. So they actually had two parts, which was one October the 1st, and the last one is actually this coming Saturday um, at a known um, nightclub in Hamtramck, which is inside of the city of Detroit. Uh, so they will be providing um, access to the vaccinations on that night, and also they'll be providing um, vaccinations at the actual event on the 19th for those who may have missed um, missed opportunity or even uh, community members who are coming into the city um, for this event. Um, it's been promoted 
um, heavily and the city of Troy Health Department will also be at the event providing assistance and support as well. Um, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, we also have the available time when those vaccinations will be administered. Uh, so we're just working with making sure the community is aware um, and also the promoter is actually pr uh, promoting and advertising this as well on her website. I think this might be the end of the slide. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, so that is the end of our slide. And just like, again, thank you all uh, for at least acknowledging the efforts and work that we're doing here in Michigan and also continuing to um, provide some innovative ways and strategies to better uh, better not only promote, but also make awareness and also accessibility to a lot of uh, needed services in our area. So again, thank you. All right, getting a lot of hearts, thumbs up, claps, whistles. Anyway, thank you very much. All right, let's turn to Washington, D.C. And uh, Christina Willett is going to talk about some of their innovative strategies for closing the gap. Christina. Thank you very much. Yes, so we can go to the next slide already. So this is just kind of a quick synopsis of the timeline of events in Washington. We had our first monkeypox case on uh, June 4th. On June 8th, we already administered our first dose of vaccine. At that time, it was, of course, only to identified close contacts and by appointment. That continued until the 27th of June when we opened our first two monkeypox clinics in Ward 2, which was at that time the highest rate of infection in the city, as well as in Ward 4. Um, at that time, we still had the standard eligibility criteria, which we kept until the 12th of August. Um, on August 1st, we opened a third monkeypox vaccine clinic in Ward 8. For those that are not familiar with the ward system in DC, that is Southeast Washington, DC, Anacostia, and it has about 43% of the district's Black or African American population. Um, on the 5th of August, we actually opened up all three vaccine clinics for walk-up clinics. This allowed people not to pre-register, but to come at their leisure. These clinics were open from noon until 8 p.m. to accommodate people to come in on lunch breaks or also after work. Each clinic was open six days a week, alternating weekends as well. So we had at least two clinics open at all times. Um, on 923, we moved over to offering only walk-up services, eliminating the entire pre-registration system. Next slide, please. This is a quick map. Again, it shows you in Ward 4, Ward 2, and Ward 8, where our vaccine clinics were located. And again, you see Ward 2 at the time that we began had the highest rate of monkeypox cases in the city. Next slide, please. What we began to notice, the top graph shows you that our case rate by race that did slowly become predominantly in the Black and Afri African American community. And on the bottom slide, you see the vaccination rate. There was a great disparity between white non-Hispanics and black African-American non-Hispanics receiving vaccine vis-a-vis -vis the actual case rate. However, what you can notice here also is that starting on or around August 5th, once we opened up the walk-in clinics on Fridays and also changed our eligibility to no longer include uh, identifying as MSM, our black vaccination rate definitely increased. Next slide, please. This one's fairly busy, but the note here is the pink are white non-Hispanic and black African-American non-Hispanic are in uh, lavender. So we saw our peak in DC the week of July 17th. And after that, you can see a fairly steady decrease in case rates among white non-Hispanics. Once on 8-5, we changed our eligibility criteria to not include MSM and opened up walk-up clinics, we start to finally see a steady decrease in the case rate among Blacks and African Americans. Next slide, please. This is well highlighted here. Our case rate for Black and African Americans was at 41 percent. 
while we still had in place the pre-registration as well as the criteria that you had to identify as MSM, our vaccination rate among Blacks and African Americans was only at 21%. Once we changed the eligibility and included those Friday walk-in clinics, we were able to increase that vaccination rate to 44%. And that is you know, definitely an accomplishment that we are very proud of. Next slide, please. So where we stand as of the other day, we have 513 cases in the district. We have administered a total of 37,341 doses of vaccine. Of those, 33,155 are DC residents. One of the other notes in our eligibility change up was that you no longer had to be a DC resident. We did this to help accommodate college kids that were in town, as well as our neighboring jurisdictions. So got a lot of shots in arms over here. Thank you. I think that's the end of our slides. Thank you so much, Christina. This is a very appreciative audience today with all the hand clapping and the hearts. All right, you get some as well. All right, and so let's turn to our colleagues in DeKalb County, Linda O'Sullivan and Minzy Zing. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Lindsay Singh, and I'm the District Epidemiologist here at DeKalb County Board of Health. And with me is Dr. Lindo Sullivan, our Clinical Nurse Manager in the Division of Clinical Services, and Kellen petty Maypon, our Epidemiologist too. And together, we will be discussing vaccine equity strategies for monkeypox in DeKalb County, Georgia. So first, let's start with the case numbers and demographics. Um, there have been 1,903 reported monkeypox slash orthopox virus cases in the state of Georgia. Of these, the vast majority at 97% of cases identify as male. And as you can see from the chart below, 77% of cases identify as Black or African American, even though only 33% of the population in Georgia uh, identifies Black. Um, and you can see that 73% of uh, Georgia cases are 26 to 45 years of age and 8% identify as having Hispanic or Latino ethnicity. Approximately 21% of all cases in Georgia reside in DeKalb County. Next slide, please. So at the local district level, we see very much the same demographic distribution uh, for cases as the rest of Georgia, as well as the metro Atlanta area. Of the 402 reported cases in our jurisdiction, the vast majority are male. And although those who identify as Black or African-American make up just 55% of our county population, they constitute approximately 79% of our monkeypox cases. Um, the age group for cases in our county tends to skew slightly younger, uh, with 70% at 20 to 39 years of age, and 6% identifying as having Hispanic or Latino ethnicity. Next slide. So at the time the US monkeypox outbreak first started, we encountered a um, number of challenges to equitable distribution of vaccines. Most of these are common to all state and local health departments throughout the US, so I'm sure everybody listening can relate. The, the groups that were overrepresented amongst our monkeypox cases, uh, the Black African American men, uh, the LGBTQ plus population, have been historically disenfranchised and may experience mistrust in government and healthcare systems. And furthermore, of course, we know that some may avoid vaccination events oriented towards specific sexual or gender identities out of fear of being stigmatized. Specifically in Georgia, um, a challenge we faced initially was that we were not able to use our statewide vaccination scheduling system at the beginning of the outbreak and had to make use of an online form that we created for signing up. So as you can imagine, these appointments were not accessible for those with lower literacy levels or who did not own a computer or a smartphone. Um, just like many other jurisdictions, demand for the vaccine, of course, far outstripped supply at the beginning, uh, which usually meant that only those who already had, had access to healthcare knew uh, how, where, and when to make appointments. We also initially found that not many healthcare providers in the community had clear information about the vaccine or how to obtain it, and therefore were not passing that information on to patients. And lastly, um, more than two years into the COVID pandemic, we found that much of the population was experiencing inertia or inaction towards vaccine information due to perceived burden and burnout. So these were the issues we were up against, and I will turn it over to Dr. O'Sullivan to describe our approach. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So for a strategy, instead of the traditional first come first serve approach, 
we recognized the barrier to vaccination and leveraged our existing relationship with the trusted local community partners to distribute the vaccines. Specifically, we partnered with the community-based organizations that were already active in the LGBT plus communities and people living with HIV and who were performing extensive outreach and providing services throughout the Cab County. Example of these local CBOs are Strive SS, Someone Cares, Positive Impact, and Stand. These trusted partners were able to help us to address barriers to vaccinations, for example, by enrolling clients who did not have access to online scheduling technologies such as smartphones and computers. We continue to provide vaccination through our client clinics alongside our mass events to address the needs of those who were eligible for vaccine but may have some fear of stigma associated with standing in line at mass events. Since we know that monkeypox does not respect borders, we made attempts to uh, accept patients from all jurisdictions, not just the Cab County. We also accommodate walk-ins as much as possible. In addition to our partnership for vaccine appointments, we provided outreach and consistent update to our CBOs and local healthcare providers to the form of guidance and health alerts. For those who attended the vaccine events, our staff also offered resources from the DeKalb County Board of Health programs in the form of uh, COVID-19 test kits, on-the-spot HIV testing, free HIV take-home kits, education on our HIV prep program and our Ryan White Clinic, as well as mental health support. Next slide, please. As a result of these efforts, the CAB has administered over 4,700 doses of um, Genius vaccine, including more than 3,000 doses at the mass events. As you can see here, the vast majority of those received both doses resided in the metro Atlanta area, with 87% of first dose recipient and 89% of second dose recipient resided in either Fulton or DeKalb County. Next slide, please. This slide, um, these graphs are showing the number of vaccines administered with time. And as you can see, there are very high um, genius vaccine uptake in July 28 until the end of September which also mirrors the number of um, cases that we were observing at the time. Next slide. Here our graphs are showing the number of vaccine recipients by race and ethnicity. As you can see on the left, approximately 1100 or 43% of all first dose were administered to those who were black and approximately 1,200 or 45% of first dose were administered to those who were white. Although we partnered with the community-based organizations throughout the vaccine efforts, we found that active distribution of vaccine appointments to the local COBs result in an increase in the proportion of those identifying as black from approximately 37% to 43% of first dose um, patients. On the right, you see that the most recipient identified as non-Hispanic or Latino. Next slide, please. So for our next steps, from here, we would be utilizing the strong connections we have made with the local COBs during monkeypox responses to help eliminate barriers to vaccinations. Since the large disparity between the proportion of cases and vaccine and vaccination in those identified as black still exist. Lessons learned, we would be um, involved involving the COBs early in the planning process for vaccine distribution and increasing outreach 
and awareness of vaccine events and activity organizing um, with our collaboration with our CBOs. We'd also engage with the local healthcare providers to increase monkeypox vaccine awareness and leverage our existing HIV STD programs to conduct uh, community outreach to those who have faced unique barriers to the vaccination process. Next slide, please. I think that is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity for us to share. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Minzi. All right, now we're going to turn to our colleagues in Oregon, Hector Zarangaza. Hector. Hello, good West Coast morning, everybody. My name is Hector Zaragoza. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a bilingual vaccine engagement coordinator for the Oregon Health Authority. I am based in Southern Oregon. Um, and yeah, today we're going to go over our community engagement um, model and our eligibility criteria, as well as what uh, the vote, the vaccine operations team equity group um, is doing to have vaccines in the community, as well as some of our examples from our field operations with OHA. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, so with our eligibility, um, we're trying to be a little bit more inclusive, recognizing that using terms like MSM or gay men um, can be um, can leave out community who do not identify as cis men or gay, but still may be at risk of HMPXV. Um, so we did keep it a little bit more broad in terms of eligibility. And um, in the next slides that we can go to, I'll kind of share um, what that looks like in practice. So. Um, Again, I'm with the VOTE team. Um, VOTE exists primarily to partner with community organizations to host um, COVID-19 specific vaccine events. Um, some of the supports that we include are culturally specific food boxes. So you can see on the image, um, we have a box from Rogue Food Unites locally. Um, and they are, a, this is the Latino box. So as you see, there are things like corn tortillas, pinto beans, and just a lot of um, jalapenos food that is um, relevant to the community we're trying to serve, right? Um, on top of that, vote will match make. So if a community-based organization requests a vaccine event, we'll reach out to our internal field operations, local health authorities and um, pharmacies or federally qualified health centers to set up a vaccine clinic. Um, and then for other partners, um, we do reimburse any of their vaccine efforts with um, FEMA funding. Next slide, please. So um, where I'm based is Medford, Oregon. I'm five hours south of Portland or five hours north of um, Sacramento, San Francisco, California. So we are pretty um, rural and local. And when all the, the cities were getting HMPXV doses in August, um, I myself as a gay Latino was trying to get doses and I wasn't able to find anything locally and I'm not the only person looking for it, right? So in order to um, help close that um, gap and provide the vaccine in a place that it wasn't, um, we did partner with some of our respected um, organizations, UNETE, that's a migrant seasonal farm worker advocacy group, as well as a Mexican folk dance group, Ballet Folklorico Ritmo Alegre. So these are um, iconic local Latino groups that, um, as you can see in the flyer, there's the Talent Harvest Festival. So we're an agriculture community, um, and that's just a yearly festival where everyone celebrates all the agriculture. So we were able to have vaccine clinics there. Uh, we did run out primarily of all of our flu doses and um, that were provided. And yeah, just below that is the Ballet Folklorico um, event that they had. There was just free offerings for the community and a little bit of um, arts and crafts. But we are, were able to administer um, flu and COVID-19 doses. Unfortunately, given that these were the two events that HMPXV was provided in the community, there was no intake. Um, next slide. Um, so then um, a little bit more recently on the left, um, we have the Illinois Valley Family Coalition. So this is a health center that serves Cave Junction, Oregon. Um, it's very rural and um, it is one of the first um, operations in Southern Oregon that was able to request um, to 
administer six HMPXV doses. And mind you, I, I want to emphasize it's very rural. So we do know that, um, you know, the six um, doses, as well as like the primary um, COVID-19 series that were administered do mean a lot in areas that are harder to reach. Um, so yeah, we're already going to be working with um, Illinois Valley to have even more HMPXV doses in their upcoming November 12th event, knowing that um, it was popular the first time and there will be more people. Um, as you see, the Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos Gala, is on November 4th, and that will be a way to um, have the vaccines um, present in the Latino community. And um, that's one way that we're destigmatizing it, right? So we have a cultural event like Dia de los Muertos. It's for families, for um, people who are want to celebrate the culture together. And conveniently, there will be vaccines on the side. So no judgment. There will be private space for people to have um, conversations with our field ops on their vaccine choices for COVID, flu, and HMPXV. Um, and next slide, please. I might have to skip again. And so, um, yeah, what we just showed were efforts in Southern Oregon. Um, five hours north in Portland, which is our bigger city in Oregon, um, we are hosting um, high volume COVID-19 and HMPXV sites. So in those um, high volume sites, we've administered 2,753 since August 11th. Um, as you can see on the slide, there are a few um, dose breakdowns on different um, either bathhouses or um, clubs where people who MSM will congregate. So um, there's just an example of some flyers that we have in collaboration with Cascade AIDS Project in the Portland metro area as well as um, a, a Spanish inclusive flyer for the Latino night that happens um, in downtown Portland every Sunday night. So that's just some of the work that we're doing in Oregon. It was a pleasure to present to all of you, and I believe that's the edge, end of my slides. Thank you so much, Hector. This has been great presentations from all of you. Lots of hand claps, hearts, and, and horns for, for all of you. All right, so let's do some Q and A. Um, and just one reminder: um, the attendance here has been outstanding, first of all. But I know there's probably a lot of people um, from your departments that want to see this either again or want to see it for the first time. We do do a replay of the recording, and that is going to be on Tuesday, November 11th at 3 p.m. Um, so same participant link that you used for this one, if you wanna send it to those in the community or across your departments just to uh, listen in, feel free to forward or just uh, for yourself, join again. All right, so a couple of really good questions in the chat. Um, first of all, we are going to be sharing the slides. So we've got a couple of questions about slide sharing and yes, we will do that. Uh, that usually happens at the end of the call, so be looking for that. Um, there's a, a good question about, um, and Hector, you talked a little bit about this, but others, if they have suggestions as well. Suggestions for non-stigmatizing language. We talk about um, using that, but can anyone give some ideas and suggestions on how to use language or strategies that aren't stigmatizing. Um, anyone want to jump in on that? For our presenters. Yes, so, I'll go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'll go ahead and jump Hector, in. Hector, you start, and then Christina, you start. So as I shared, um, our eligibility requirement is um, basically we took away the language of um, men who have sex with men or gay men, as we did identify that that could leave people out who don't identify within those categories. Um, and also just recognize that public health is, you know, for the public. So um, instead, our eligibility is just more focused on if you think you were exposed to um, HMPXV or monkeypox. And I'll let Tim, who has um, his hand up, to answer a little bit more. Yeah, just to dovetail with what Hector is saying in terms of the Oregon approach, we actually had five or six community engaged sessions where we pulled CBOs, providers, tribes, um, LPHAs together actually to define our eligibility criteria. And so we um, took away 
sexual message, you know, um, 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 linking it to sexual orientation, specific gender identities. And we basically have, um, it says anyone who anticipates having or has had recent direct skin to skin contact with one or more people and knows someone in their social circles or their communities who has had monkeypox or HMPXV. We use that as our, um, our uh, abbreviation. And so the even though the, that first criteria sounds really, really broad, it's that second one that brings the specificity and brings the sort of network piece. And then people identify as, you know, having, you know, been experiencing it through their friends or their um, or their communities. So it was a really like intensive community engaged process to get to that point, though. Thanks, Tim. All right, I'm going to go to Christina and then Keith. Thank you. Yeah, basically, once we changed our eligibility criteria, excluding the terminology of MSM as a criteria, we basically just said all people of any sexual orientation or gender who have had multiple sex partners in the past two weeks. There's additional criteria, but I think that really opened it up for folks to not have to identify in any specific way, just if you've had multiple partners, and of course, you know, we didn't validate that, anyone who felt basically at that point that they wanted to be vaccinated, it really just opened the doors to them. And you had good results with that, Christina, as well, right? You yes, saw like I said, as soon as that increased. changed, we definitely, what I didn't display here so much was the uptick in women who came uh -huh. and, be, and got vaccinated for a variety of reasons. So that was very encouraging as well. Okay, Keith. Yes, really quick. Uh, so one thing I did want to point out with um, with uh, community members identifying themselves, one of the things that we had to um, kind of educate providers as well on uh, allowing community to self-identify themselves. Um, and I think one of the uh, one of the things that stood out, uh, we have been responding effortlessly to the molecular surveillance program here. Um, in our state and one of the things that we've been seeing is individuals who engage in sex with um trans and uh transgender women um but they still identify as straight and educating uh providers on um not kind of mirroring or connecting uh gender identity and sexual orientation as one um and i think that's one of the barriers that we've been seeing with community members even wanting to even take a uh, take a hiv test because of that identity piece um and not feeling like that they're they're able to identify the way that they want to. So we've been working, uh, working with kind of educating providers and also allowing the community to kind of self identify themselves um, and whatever that looks like. So whenever uh, there is a lot of data or anything that may come up, then we have to kind of express to providers um, and also just local and state health departments uh, on that, just making sure that we are advocating properly with um, not only noting that on future um, uh, future assessments or applications, but also just making sure that we're uh, making sure that the individuals who are providing those services are culturally human, uh, have cultural uh, awareness to the communities where they are providing those services. All righty. We've got a lot of really good questions in the chat um, and a couple of suggestions. One saying perhaps adding at perhaps adding two spirited to the language might be helpful. So tossing out that suggestion. Um, also one correction from me, our replay is actually November 1st and not November 11th. I guess I was seeing double on that. Um, a question about um, how, are, how are you tracking um, vaccine status to ensure people are returning for their second dose. I know that's been a bit of a challenge. Has anyone cracked the code on that and come up with anything that's an effective strategy? Mark and then Keith. Yeah. I'll say um, Mark can take it away. Oh, I was going to say it seems like I think probably way simpler uh, or sound simpler but qr codes are really really useful at these events so like mm -hmm. if we've had some um in partnership with this project as far as like having folks take surveys 
um, but like also one thing that I've been doing is just using like the native calendar app that's on both iPhone and Android smartphones and just setting up a QR code where folks can scan it and it will automatically put a reminder on their calendar app, letting them know four weeks from that date that they'll be due for dose two. Um, we include like whoever our lead clinic uh, is for, for the event, uh, like their contact information, um, as well as like the michigan.gov slash MPV page, just so it's like easily accessible. And then we'll do like a, I, I usually set them up to have like a 24 hour reminder ahead of time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been really great, especially at these events too, because like the, the, the providers will also generally have like a, not necessarily the, the cards we all got used to for COVID, but even just like a quick card that'll remind the person that they've got uh, dose two scheduled that doesn't have to be at like a pop-up event. They can just come right in to that provider's clinic and get get their second dose. So I think both those strategies, really simple, but really, really effective. QR codes are awesome. All right. Um, question in the chat about, um, oops, sorry, about vaccine administration and some of the challenges associated with that. Um, how did you handle concerns about interdermal administration and skin reactions in the context of vaccine equity issues? Anyone have any thoughts about that? Keith. Uh, I think just for me, this main practice is ensuring that um, ensuring that the community is being educated on a lot of these updates and changes. Um, and I think that was one of the things that I personally had to do with community members, because um, I think in the middle of the time we were doing the, um, they were administering the vaccination. When I first got my first, when I got it in my arm, and the second one was under the skin. So they educated me, but community members get a little hesitant or no, I don't want it to get my second shot because of that. So just kind of reiterating that education around the four and so getting that second dose and also just understanding why it's under the skin um, and making sure that education is available. I'm, I'm very firm and a believer with whatever information we know, I feel like the community should be just as aware uh, as well I'm ensuring that there is no hesitancy with individuals uh, receiving vaccination. All right. Um, there's a question about making sure that as we broaden our um, eligibility criteria that that we're not um, sort of encouraging the worried well. Is Are any of you worried about that or any of you thought that maybe that would be a problem as we start to broaden eligibility criteria or is that really not an issue? Greg, do you have your hand up to answer that? Um, I was not that particular question, um, I, I, the earlier question. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Sure, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, so uh, it is important to get the word out about those options that you mentioned, Keith, and a colleague who works in the vaccine task force, this question came up and so she said, she provided this phrasing that some vaccine recipients may express concern about the intradermal administration in the forearm, like concerns that, that you mentioned, Keith, about stigma, if someone can see the wheel, if the forearm is exposed. And this colleague said, please remind um, colleagues, especially vaccinators, that intradermal administration of vaccine may be performed also at the upper back below the scapula or at the deltoid. And some vaccine recipients may prefer that, those options because of the ability to cover the administration site with clothing. And in addition, Janaeos okay. um, can also be administered subcutaneously if the recipient has concerns about intradermal administration. Thank you. All right, Tim seemed to agree with that approach. All right. Um, question that I think we should address um, that's that was brought up in the chat about using language other than monkeypox. Thoughts and suggestions from all of you as to how you have addressed this issue in your own communities. Anyone want to tackle that? Can you repeat that question one more time for me? I'm sorry. Sure. 
Um, question in the chat about the, the use of the term monkeypox and, um, and, and how offensive that could be. Anyone address that in your communication materials or thought through that and come up with different terminology? So, so that is very interesting to hear. I personally have not heard anything about that uh, being offensive, but definitely taking that, uh, taking note of that um, and finding other ways to kind of put that in language. And I do agree with, the, uh, depending on um, the community serve, and I definitely think that there does need to be some unique approach with each community uh, with addressing not only uh, not only uh, MPX but also other um, other health related uh, illnesses. So I think with I think that's a good idea, and I think we're just maybe using the abbreviation instead of using monkeypox could possibly assist with that as well so i whoever said that thank you i could probably take that back to my own health department and address that as well we're all learning right we're all learning that's the point of this hector do you want to add to that yeah i'll go ahead and add to it so um part of why oha uses hmpxv is because of um feedback and the um, problematic historical associations related around using um, the monkey word. Um, I think also as a community member myself, you know, you see nowadays there's like the emoji, the monkey emoji, and then just pox or m pox is what um, people are saying, referring to it casually in queer LGBTQ spaces. And also I want to um, flag a program like the vote program. I work with the Latino specific organizations, but um, we do have um, staff who are working with um, black specific communities. So, um, and kind of what I do with the Latino community is I'll get um, feedback from them. What do they prefer? What do they hear? What do they suggest? And you go with what the community says. So um, that's one way to lead with um, what community input would be. Okay, great suggestion. A um, couple of other questions, and then we're going to close out in about three minutes or so. Um, for those of you that are doing walk-up clinics, um, where you're not necessarily scheduling people, are have there been any concerns or any issues with wasting a vaccine? Um, and if so, how how did you deal with that? So far, we have not really had much of an issue with waste. You know, um, we have also been able to service other facilities like jails and so forth by mm -hmm. bringing vaccine to them or exposures in um, other kinds of fa facilities where we don't normally have vaccine. Um, we are moving now to have monkeypox vaccine available uh, anywhere where COVID vaccines are available. Uh, the goal is again to increase numbers of people coming in more so than the hesitation or on our end potential waste. We did see people were a little hesitant to stand in line at a place that advertised monkeypox vaccine. So combining the clinics offering it that way uh, will hopefully help us increase our numbers in the very beginning, we would, if you will, sell out of vaccine appointments in under two minutes. You know, that was 800 appointments, two minutes booked. Wow. We have seen a steady decline in interest and hopefully uh, combining COVID and monkeypox and everything under one roof will again further destigmatize. All righty. Yes, um, we, sorry, oh, we, we also offer uh, walk-ins and we have not had much problems with um, wasting of vaccines. So um, we have been doing well in that aspect as well. And we offer it in the clinics. So I don't know if that also does everyone come in to get their different vaccines, um, use that opportunity as well. So we have not had problems with wasting. All right. Um, just a quick note that the slides have been added to the chat. So if you're interested in the in obtaining the slides, they have been posted to the chat as well. One more quick question, um, and that is, do any of you have 
effective strategies for reaching trans people? Any, any, any suggestions that are specific to the trans community? Keith. Oh God. Um, so I would say one for me, and if this um, one of the things for me is that I, I'm a firm believer of meeting the community where they are. Um, and one of the one of the biggest things that have uh, bothered me, even with the work that is being done here, is meeting the community at not at untraditional hours, um, particularly with uh, trans individuals. Um, in certain communities where consensual sex work may be happening. Um, even here in our area, uh, cruising has been a very big thing, especially during COVID. So how do we meet that community individuals who are engaging in public sex um, and making sure that there's some type of illustration or education or even access for those individuals during that time. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we lack um, in here in our area. So we're working diligent, diligently um, now, especially with the mobile health initiative we've uh, developed here this year called the Pull-Up Project, where we'll be providing those services at non-traditional hours. And we're actually um, partnering with other organizations to kind of provide uh, direct teleprep and also uh, ways to where we can have um, immediate response to treatment for not only HIV, but also sexually transmitted infections. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much to our CDC colleagues, as well as our colleagues from Michigan, Washington, DC, DeKalb County and Oregon for a very, very informative um, conversation. Very much appreciate your participation and thank all of you for joining as well. Remember, our replay is November 1st um, and slides are in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your participation. Bye-bye.